All right, so let me get my game reopened here. So here's Unity. Remember uh, last time we updated our external tools so to open up the real Visual Studio for editing code. I don't personally care if you do that or not, but it'll help you with command completion and, and stuff like that. So you probably want to do that. Um, so if you recall, last time we messed around with putting different colors on there. And uh, so we, we back in our assets, we created several folders. And remember, folders are just for human organization, right? This is not a Unity requires you to do this thing. So we create a folder to hold our scripts and hold our scenes and hold our our materials so we created a couple different materials last time you know this yellowish one for the player and this pinkish one for the ground you pick your poison um but you know materials are things that they're sort of kind of like textures but we can create them with solid colors uh textures come in all sorts of different shapes and forms and they can wrap 3d objects and stuff like that we're not going to deal with that maybe ever but certainly not now so this is how we create colors on things <laughs> is uh, with our materials. Then we went ahead and we said, hey, we want to make our uh, uh, our player move. So if I click on player here, um, we're going to we're going down the rabbit hole because I've actually never done their player input uh, thing before. But it looks like it's a message sending type thing. So I'll talk about it as we as we get to it. So I, it kind of seems clear to me how it's going to work. Um, so we added a component uh, to our player called player input that presumably is going to make it easier to make the player move. Um, I might, once I get into it, if it looks like it's going to suck, I might just switch over to just coding all player movement, but let's see where the rabbit hole goes. So then we went ahead and created a player script. So this is kind of where we ended up last time. And um, remember the player script, you, you can create a new script in here, then you drag it onto the player. Um, and if you remember, they had in the video, they had you add a component, new C-sharp script, yada, yada, yada. Then it showed up in your generic assets folder. Then you had to drag it into uh, your scripts folder for organization, whatever. I usually will create scripts inside of this generic folder first or inside of the scripts folder first. Even though in this case, what we're coding right now is our um, the logic for our player. If you think about, I think I probably used the example last class when we start making our monsters dance around and stuff like that, we're probably going to have all the monsters play by the same script, right? So if we have five different monsters in our, in our game, we're going to write one script and have them all play by the same rules, do their own thing, but they'll each have their own version of that script. So they'll know which room they're currently in and which exits lead out of that room and yada, yada, yada. Make some, make some sense. All right. So it's pretty common in game development for you to write a single script for a behavior uh, for one of your actors, let's say, and then attach that to multiple actors. All right. At some point, we're also going to create something called a prefab, which allows us to like, uh, we'll probably do it for monster, which allows us to basically create our object that's our monster and then save it as like a template when whenever we need a new monster, we just drag it out there that already has all the scripts and stuff like that attached to it. So we'll burn that bridge when we get to it. In this case, the script is a one off because it's going to be the controller stuff for our player. We'll go ahead and double click on the script. And uh, as long as you have your external tool set up correctly, it'll try to launch Visual Studio. So here's my Visual Studio daily flippy thingy. I think you're going to get updates to Visual Studio all the time, too, at least on the Mac. I just updated it yesterday, I think. And now it seems like there's another update, probably to fix what they broke in the current update. Wait, the way it goes. All right. So if you remember from last time, start is kind of, so this idea of a mono behavior. So player controller, this is C sharp code. He extends mono behavior. So this is inheritance. Okay. Just instead of the word extend, you put the little, little colon there. All right. So this idea of a mono behavior, that is the core of all things that uh, follow the, the, the game, um, the heartbeat of our game. Um, and that is through this update method. So anything that you want to have happen every single time you either have a new frame or, or uh, uh, 60 frames a second, something like that, 
it must be a mono behavior. He gets all the stuff that gets managed by the rest of the game engine. All right. The start function gets called exactly one time before the very first frame. So this is like your setup, your setup deal. Now we are going to bring, be bringing our Java objects into this. So kind of where we're going to ultimately go here is we're going to have this visual version of our, of our game. Okay, so we're going to put an interface into the game. That's what Unity is going to let us do. And the things dancing around are going to be, um, you know, playing by the stuff we're learning about right now. But we're also going to have the same objects that we created before that's going to kind of keep track of the current state of the dungeon under the hood. So it's almost like somebody, you know, it's like, oh, that monster moved from there to there. Okay, let me update my little map behind the scenes, right? So we're going to be keeping track programmatically of all the stuff that's actually happening and then showing you that stuff on the screen. And then kind of, so this is something called MVC, Model View Controller, where we have our, our visual and uh, that's the view. And then we have our code behind it. That's the controller. Okay, but in this case, we also have the uh, model, which is our data. So we will have a room object like we did before. That's our model. We will have our visual or room view, the interface for what a room looks like. And then we'll have our scripts that govern that room. Those will be the controllers for the room. All right. So all three of those guys will be talking to each other to make sure what we see on the screen is being kept track of behind the scenes so we can programmatically figure out where, where dudes are. And that's important because what we don't want to get into, not that you can't do it, but if we kind of think about old school game programming, what we don't want to get into is we don't want to have a whole bunch of stuff that's bound by like coordinates where we're saying, okay, does this, is this monster's current location on the screen inside the bounds of this square that represents uh, this particular room? Or is it inside the bounds of this square, which represents this current room? And then all of a sudden we decide, oh, well, let's make our rooms a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller. Let's change the orientation of our map. Uh, now things are not, not nearly as generic as they should be. And are we have a very proprietary type uh, map situation. All right, so we want to leverage our programming knowledge to do this. And we'll, we'll see this by examples as we, uh, as we go through it. All right, so the start menu uh, or start function gets called one time. That's your setup for uh, the controller associated with this player. And then update gets called for every single frame. Last time we mentioned that um, there is a version of update called fixed update that limits this to 60 frames per second. So if you want to kind of create an even playing field, regardless of how good somebody's graphics card is, um, this it'll be a maximum number of updates at 60 times per second instead of, hey, if you have the $2,000 graphics card, you're getting 600 updates a second or something like that. All right. For us, this really isn't going to matter, but just something to kind of keep in mind that. And the important aspect is anything we put inside of update, this code will run every single frame so if you have a graphics card that's driving 100 frames a second this will this code will get called a hundred times per second so you need to make sure whatever you're doing in here doesn't take very long make sense you can't do like a you know download a one gigabyte file a hundred times every second and you're gonna you're gonna overload the number of threads in your system real quick your game's going to get stupid sluggish, and uh, then you could still sell it as a money grab under EA Sports. <laughs> All right, so, <laughs> okie dokie. So questions about uh, about the, the, the base setup? All mono behaviors get this one-two punch. They have some other stuff in there too, That, but this is our starting point for one-two punch. All right, get everything set up one time. What do you want me to do every single time the frame updates? Okie dokie. All right. So now let's go and see how we make our dude move using this new fangled player movement, dealy, flippy, thingy, majiggy. All right. So uh, did we already add the rigid body? All right. Well, at least I talked about it uh, last time because I showed it falling through. So here's our player. Our player has a rigid body associated with it. Uh, this rigid body has you can give it a mass whether or not you want it to have gravity uh, be associated with it things like that this is how we give the physica physicality of objects is through a rigid body okay 
Um, so we went ahead and added that to our sphere because what we want to be able to do is we want physics to be able to operate on this guy. All right, one way or another, I'll have to see how our player input thing works, but one way or another, we're going to be shoving that ball in different directions to make it move. Okay. So, so you're saying we already did that one? We already did that one. Um, do we already add the input component? Player input. Added the input component. Nailed it. Uh, create the new script. Did that. Write the on move function declaration. Okay, so let's see what this guy says to do. Um, my guess is they're going to use message passing based on what I saw from here, and I'll give you some context on that. Oh, hold on a second. Am I... I need to make sure I'm sharing my screen. It's okay. Okay, now we're doing that. Okay, let's get started with your first script. You'll see that there is some code already there. This is a template to make it easier to get started writing Unity scripts. A function is a way to group code under one name. There are two functions included in the script template start and update. You can use the function name as a shorthand or call the function instead of writing the same code every time. The code in start is called when your game starts and the code in update is called once per frame of your game. You won't actually need the update function in this script, so remove that code for now. Before you begin writing code, let's think for a moment. Okay, now con consider what that ultimately means. When we remove the update, you still are getting an update function that does nothing just like how threads in Java worked, where if you don't override the, the run method, they just do nothing, right? So it's still behind the scenes. Perhaps uh, it, uh, the way the script building works, because it actually runs C-sharp as, um, let's call it half compiled, it actually uses as a scripting language, which is more like an interpreted language uh, when it's using it inside of... Um, Python for us or inside of Unity when we're running it like this and not until we actually build our executable does it, let's call it pick up some speed by compiling it. But uh, um, maybe it's doing some kind of optimization behind the scenes where if you remove update, it's not going to try to call the empty update method 100 times a second by my example. Even though it's doing nothing, doing any trying to do something 100 times a second doesn't seem to be overly efficient. What do you need to do with the script? The script needs to check every frame for player input and then apply that to the player game object, every frame as movement. Where will it check for the movement? The input system has a method you can use to get the data from this input. Where will it apply the movement? There are two things you can use to apply this, update and fixed update. Update is called before rendering a frame, and this is where most of your code will go. Fixed update, on the other hand, is called just before performing any physics calculations, and this is where your physics code will go. You will be moving the ball by applying forces to its rigid body. This is physics. So you will put this part of the code in fixed update. Okay, let's get started. Because you are using the input system, you need to add its namespace to the script. Namespaces are a collection of classes and other data types which can be imported at the start of your scripts. There are already three namespaces used in the template system.collections, system.collections.generic, and Unity Engine. There are lots of different namespaces. The additional one you need for this script is the input system namespace. Add a new line below the first three namespaces. Write using Unity Engine dot input system semicolon. All right, let's... Let's keep up with that. So we go into our script here. We're adding another namespace here. Namespaces are kind of like packages in Java, even though when we learn Java, we just pretended like everything was part of the default package. So this is using Unity Engine dot input system. That guy? All right. So do you see how it did command completion stuff there? 
that's why you want to use it. <laughs> that's, why, that's why you want to use this guy so you don't have to type it. It's possible, like I said, VS Code will will you can get it connected to do it. But anybody does anybody use VS Code for this and does it work? You can run it in wine. Yeah, I also have Windows on the other. Uh, oh, I see. All right. Is there another question? What's up? Is the is doing your system namespace not redundant if you need an Oh, oh, no, no, no. It's it's not. Um. So he's asking, is this plus this aren't they redundant of each other? My understanding. And we'll see if they they fix this. But I, I I think it only goes down one layer. It's not recursive. So when I say using Unity Engine, it gives us all of the top level stuff inside of Unity Engine. It doesn't give us sub namespaces within Unity Engine stuff. It doesn't follow the yellow brick road down, down, down. So if we need to use the input system, that namespace happens to live inside of unity engine so we are adding an additional set of li uh, additional library to this uh this way all right um no i think that's probably a uh you know uh, so if we were in uh for instance in java we might say import java.util now in java import java.util no doesn't actually make any sense because this is, util is a package. Now, inside of that package, we have sub packages. Now, if util had, um, well, so you asked the question, this is just a C sharp thing. No, because it's still something that behaves like C sharp. Uh, and there's other languages that do this as well. But when I import java.util, it's not going to give me anything. But dot star says, give me everything that lives inside of java.util. This guy right here is equivalent to this guy right here. As opposed to if there were a sub package inside of util, which there might be, I, I just don't know off the top of my head. But let's say there was a java.util.awt for abstract windowing toolkit. It's not in there in someplace else, but just making that up. Um, then you can say, I want to import java.util.awt.star because just inputting java.util.star will not get you the stuff that also lives inside of sub packages. Because that would make, I mean, if that was the default behavior, your executables would become gigantic, right? Um, because really what you probably want to directly do if you want to be as efficient as possible, and we've seen this before in Java, import java.util.awt.star scanner right only give me access to that one dude right because that's the only guy i'm going to use that kind of thing make sense all right all right so now what we've done is we've give, given ourselves access to whatever magic tricks the input system is going to give us and my gut feeling here is it's using uh um message passing probably is there gonna be some kind of callback function that we're going to put in here. We can even probably make a guess like on input something, uh, whatever. Ah, we'll see what it is. But there's going to be some event that gets called every single time the user interacts with the uh, um, uh, input system. And then we can deal with what happened there as opposed to just dealing with it inside of update as just part of the update uh, things. I guess it's maybe going to be the difference between um, your email being on push versus having having your email check every minute or check a hundred times a second in this version of things. When it's on push, whenever a new email comes, it gets pushed to your phone. So you only get email when it sends you new email as opposed to checking constantly for, did he push a button? 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 Let's see if that pans out to what's actually going on in here. So we got our namespace. This will enable you to access the code and functions in the input system namespace in this script. The player input component will notify the player controller script of action happening by calling functions with predefined names within your scripts. For example, to create the rollerball game, you need to be notified whenever the move action happens. The predefined function for the changes in movement controls 
when pressing WASD or moving a joystick on a controller on is called on move. All right, in so it looks like it shows us that inside of Unity. So if I click on player in Unity and I look at my player input thing here, it shows me this guy will send messages to this game object and it's going to send all these different messages. So you can almost think of this like exception handling that we talked about in uh, in Java, okay? where if something bad happens, or in this case, if, if something happens, doesn't have to be a bad thing, uh, something gets called. Okay, So we get a message when a device was lost, when a device regained connection, when controls changed, whenever we move, I'm guessing that's the one we're probably going to use, uh, on look, on fire, um, oh, that's probably going to be like the space bar or whatever trigger is. On navigate, on submit, on cancel, on point, on click. Those are going to be more user interface stuff. Uh, on scroll wheel, on middle click, on right click, on track device position, on track device orientation. Okay. So those are all the messages this player input um, uses. So, so far, I, I'm I'm actually sort of buying into this. I thought it was going to be a stupid, redundant thing, but let's see if they, they make me change my opinion. But those are all the different messages that are going to get sent with these different events might occur. All right. And I'm guessing we're going to be using that on move, dude. All right. So let's go back here. In that function, the computer will read the value of the input, for example, up, down, left, or right, and then use that information to move the ball using code in the update function which you'll write later. Let's write an onMove function. The first thing you need to do is write a function declaration, which tells the computer to create a function. Now, let's see if these guys are is hooked up. Oh, I don't get an onMove? I hate everything you stand for. All right. Maybe if we close Visual Studio and reopen it, it'll reload it. Right, whatever. Below the start function, but before the final curly brace, add a new line. Write void, on move, open and closed brackets. All right. So notice C Sharp follows the exact same naming convention stuff for functions in Java. So this guy's going to return nothing. Void. So you specifically make my life worse. Is that what it is that what we're talking about? All right. So, so we have void on move, takes no parameters. And right now I just put an open and closing curly brace, and we're gonna build the so this guy will get called whenever one of our buttons that is involved in movements gets pressed. All right. So what we're doing here is very similar to what we did with threads when we wrote our own public void run functions. So we're overriding the default on move function that does nothing with what we want to actually happen when an on move thing happens. Void means that this function won't return any values. Next, add an open curly brace, leave a line, and then add a closed curly brace. The space inside the braces is called the function body. And this is where you add instructions for the computer to complete. These instructions are specifically for the function on move. Each function has its own set of curly braces. OK, what's next? The player input component will be sending data of type input value uh, to your script. Okay. So you need to add this to the function's input parameters. These are variables which will be used to store and reference data for the function. So I want to I want to stop here just for a second so we can go look at documentation for this before we go any further. I'm going to look at Unity Engine Input System. So let's assume we're not following along with this, this video thing here. Oh, do I need to? Oh, I guess I can just come back to that. So I'm going to go ahead. Actually, I already had the documentation open. Search manual. Input system. All right, so here's our input system. Let's see if this is the right guy.
Here's our events. Mm, we'll probably don't like the way any of that's looking. Let's just do a Google search for that at the top level. Engine. Okay, here's our namespace for this guy. So we're going to go and find on move, right? Is that in here? Okay, I got to find that in a different place. Did you see it? Oh, there's the interfaces that are here. We learned about interfaces. These are enumerated types. That's like inventing your own um, uh, uh, data types, but simple data types. search for on move here so is it is it literally just poorly documented that'd be perfect okay so well at least i found it right here we have on move it takes in an input value value all right so we could probably go in here and I might be able to find on move. All right. So this guy is going to, the parameter he's going to take in is something of type input value. All right. An input value is going to probably come in a couple of different flavors. It could be a key press. It could be a button push on a, on a joystick, all sorts of things like that. All right. So but he's gonna. This is gonna be an object of type input value. Now, realistically, behind the scenes, input value might be an abstract class. Remind me, what's an abstract class? Yeah, you don't create instances of of input values because input values is a generic idea. Input values may become in the form of keyboard inputs, joystick inputs, yada 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 yada. We're making a guess if that's what input value actually uh, uh, is. Let's test our. Uh... Class input value. So he gets an is pressed, just whatever it is. Are we going to be able to ask what it is? Well, yeah, so this is this is how we, uh, these are properties. So it's this is a getter and a setter. So we can get whether or not this guy was pressed. But actually the way it looks here is it looks like they are the top level generic. So an input value can be any of those things, um, whether it's keyboard, joystick, and we just ask, was it pressed? Hopefully somewhere in there we can ask, who, what, what are you? You know, what what kind of what kind of dealio uh, you know did you just bring to the table? All right, well let's just keep cooking here. Inside the parentheses in your function call, add input value, movement value. Movement value is the name of the. All right, so we're gonna inside of on move. We're gonna take in input value. Now, you can name your parameter here, whatever you want, all right? This is no different than Java. I'm taking something in of type input value, but I'm gonna just name mine MV or move value, okay? Just to purposely be different than the video, just to kind of drive that point home that whatever you name your parameter here is how you must use it inside of here, identical to Java and every other language, okay? The variable you will use within the function. Input value is the type of variable. Variables can have different data types, which means they store different types of data. The movement of the rollable sphere will be captured in two directions, up and down and left and right. In other words, the movement value variable will capture and store the data from the x direction and the y direction of input devices. 
This kind of data can be stored as a vector2 variable. In the next video, you'll create that variable and then start to apply the data to the player sphere. All right, so. So inside here, we're going to be able to get information about the movement value. All right. Um, and uh, if possible, we'll have to give it a component thing here. But what we're going to end up doing is inside of here, if they press up, we're going to do one thing. If they press down, we're going to do another thing. They press left, they press right, we're going to do other things. But no matter what it is, we're going to be operating on the our player, but not the player generically. We're going to be operating on a specific component of our player. It's going to be the rigid body component of our player. All right, makes sense? Because that's the guy that physics can act on. Now, at this point, we know that this script, because we did it, is attached to our player game object, right? Our player game object has a whole bunch of stuff hanging on it as well. It has the script, it has a rigid body, all this other stuff. But as of right now, the guy that this is actually attached to is the generic game object that's repre that represents our player. So we're going to need to give ourselves access to the rigid body component of the dude that this guy's connected to so that we can start putting physics on that guy. That makes sense? All right, so um, they might not write it this exact same way, but let's just do it. So I'm gonna go ahead and give myself a private value here because I'm only gonna use it inside this class, all right? But I wanna have access to it inside of update and on move and all these other things. So I'm gonna do it up here. Um, I hope that they don't put it inside of on move because then you're recreating it every single time, but maybe that gets optimized out, but whatever. All right, so I'm gonna say private. We're gonna create a rigid body. I'll just call that guy RB or rigid body. All right, so now I wanna go ahead and I wanna set that rigid body equal to something. Okay, this is starting to look pretty much like Java here. Okay, so I'm gonna set the rigid body associated with this instance of player controller. All right, this means the same thing in C Sharp as it does in uh, Java. And I wanna set that equal to, I need to have a way of extracting that component, the rigid body component from the game object that owns this. So I'm gonna say this dot get component rigid body. So I'm asking the game object, the dude who owns this script, to give me one of his components. Give me access to one of his components. Any of you who've programmed before, do you know what the syntax inside of these angle brackets is called? Go ahead. Generic. Yeah, it's, a, it's called generics. Uh, generics came out... Um, uh, it's, it exists both in Java and uh, C Sharp, but did not exist in like C++ um, until standard template library got updated. But in any case, the idea is that if you want to have a generic type of object that like a collection object, like for instance, in Java, we have a thing called an array list. Now, a generic array list holds a collection of stuff. It's written in terms of holding generic objects right so if you just create a generic array list and you start putting things into that array list when you take those things out they'll come out as generic objects and then you have to turn them into other things right to what they actually are because you maybe know that oh, i threw monsters i threw monsters into that guy but they're gonna come out as objects because you didn't you didn't uh, use the generic subsystem to dictate what you're actually putting in there so with generics, it allows us to write a generic type of class, like ArrayList, but say that when this guy is being built, we can add additional meaning to the kinds of things he might hold. So I can build an ArrayList built for holding monsters, for example. And I do that with the, with the angle brackets at the time of creation. Once I do that, then when I get stuff from that ArrayList, they come out as monsters rather than generic objects, all right? It helps us with a lot of typecasting that we would have to do later on because we might know that they were monsters, 
but we're going to keep pulling them out of there as objects. And then we need to remind uh, the runtime what, what this guy actually was. Okay. Now, in this case, this dot get component, I'm just going to drop down to the next line here. This dot get component. Notice that if I go over here to the right, it shows me that what this returns is a generic component. Okay. Now, I think I'm going to be okay here throwing that generic comp component into an object that is a rigid body. And then I'll be able to use him as a rigid body. Now, if it screams at me when we go to do this, then I will have to say, I want this guy to be a rigid body. So make sure you, is it lowercase b? Yeah, that guy. So treat him as a rigid body because this will come out of here as a generic component. But since I'm using generics to ask it, for the rigid body component of it. This is kind of a crappy use of generics because they're using the generic subsystem to request the kind of element you want from there rather than building it to give you those kind of elements. But whatever. I would say the historic way of doing this would have been get component. And then in parentheses here, you would pass in the kind of component you wanted, maybe even a string. I want the rigid body. Um, but fine, this is, this is how you do it in Unity. All right, so my guess is since I'm using generics to ask for a rigid body, it will actually come out of here as a rigid body. So I won't have to typecast it to Super Ninja like that. I won't have to typecast that to uh, a rigid body because I'm putting it into a variable that is a rigid body. All right, remember this start function only gets called once. So when this script first spins up, He's going to, and remember at the global level, so everything inside of this class player controller, we have access to this variable called RB, which is type rigid body. But I need to give that guy a value. So when this script first starts, I'm going to give him a value. What value? The value that is associated with the component, the rigid body component of the game object that's, that this script is attached to. Make sense? So now that I have that inside of here, I have access to that rigid body. And I can start doing stuff to it, like, you know, putting physical forces on it, setting its velocity, you know, however they're deciding to do the movement here. But, you know, I now have the rigid bodiness of this, uh, of this game object. So now I can do things physics wise to it. Make some sense? All right, so let's go back here and let's see what she actually does <laughs> hopefully it's something pretty similar in the last video you wrote a declaration for the on move function next let's use the method get to get movement input data from the sphere and store it as a vector 2 variable in the space inside the on move function add the line vector 2 movement vector equals movement value dot get, open angle bracket, vector two, closed angle bracket, open and closed brackets, semicolon. All this right. code takes or gets. All right, so let's go back and explain this. So inside of on move, what they first are having us do is they're having us extract the vector two um, aspect of from MV. All right, so we're gonna create a variable here called vector two of type vector two. Um, what did she call her her variable? Input input vector, like that. All right, whatever. All right, so she called it that. So we're going to use our parameter MV. We're going to get something. What are we going to get? We are going to get the vector two component from MV. So we have an input value. We're going to ask that input value to get us the vector two component of it, which is effectively an XY, XY component. So vector two sounds maybe scarier. We also have vector threes, which are XYZs, right? Okay, but that's all it is. It's a struct that holds two pieces of information, an X and a Y, all right? Um, actually, you technically don't have to hold an X and Y in a vector two. You can hold two whatevers in a generic vector two. Typically they're used for holding X and Y's. 
All right, so now all I did is I created a local variable here that holds only the vector two aspect of my input value. Let's see what we're gonna do with that now. I just happen to have that information, all right? The vector two data from the movement value and stores it in a vector two variable you are creating called movement vector. The player game object uses a rigid body and interacts with a physics engine. Next, you need to use the variable you just created to add or apply forces to the rigid body and move the player game object in the scene. To do this, rigid. your player controller script will need to access the rigid body component and add force to the player game object. First, let's create a variable to hold the reference in the script. Above the start function, add the following code, private rigid body RB, semicolon. This will create a private variable of the type of rigid body and call that variable he is copying me. I promise I didn't look at this. Or RB. This will hold a reference to the rigid body you need to access. The variable is private and not public because you don't need this variable to be accessible from the inspector or from other scripts right now. Next, inside the start function, write RB equals get component, open angle bracket. Oh, oh tactically, she's okay. This dot RB is not necessary here since... Our scoping rules indicate there isn't a local variable here named RB, so it will find the rigid body up here, but I still like this dot RB. We're not gonna remove points. We're just gonna let her know that. Rigid body, closed angle bracket, open and closed brackets, semicolon. This sets the value of the variable RB by getting a reference to the rigid body component attached to the player sphere game object. There is definitely a rigid body component attached to the game object because you added that component earlier. All of the code in the start function is called on the first frame that the script is active. This is often the very first frame of the game, so the player will be able to move the sphere straight away. Now you need to set up the fixed up. Now what she just said is actually important. That start gets called the very first frame of the game. So you will have that rigid body component before on move would get called. You'll have access to that value. All right, because that is an important timing thing that you will sometimes run into where you might have something that happens ahead of you might you might get um, uh, an event that occurs that actually happens before you got the value of the thing you're going to do something with. So now all of a sudden you try to do it here, you get a weird null pointer exception or something. You're like, well, why? Because well, you didn't have access to that object because you're playing this weird timing game. All right. Um, and that's actually very common in operating systems with um, multi-core and even multi-threading. Um, when you have multi-core processors and you say, well, what, what things can happen at the same time? Well, things that don't have to do with each other, right? Because if you need the value of this guy before you can do anything over here, don't try to make them happen at the same time. That will be a problem, right? Okay. Can't shovel the snow till the snow's already fallen. Make sense? Although that would be kind of funny if there's just somebody out in their driveway, <laughs> just sunny day, <laughs> just, just scoping. All right. State function, so you can call add force on the rigid body stored in the variable RB. First, create a new function called fixed update below the start function. And just like that function, the type should be void. All right, so we'll go ahead and put in our fixed update. She dumped update earlier, that's fine. But you should be able to put in fixed update there. All right. So now that's the guy that gets called. Um, I'm pretty sure, that, I mean, my knowledge of this might be a little dated, but I think it gets called one time uh, up to 60 times a second, 60 frames a second. That's typically what fixed updates for is to give an equal playing field across uh, all people playing the game. Okay, so we got our fixed update. Because it will perform a task and not return. Yeah, so remember that this guy is gonna get called 60 times per second. And we're gonna do something with it here. And any values. And there should be no parameters in the parentheses. <clears throat> You'll learn more about the uses of the void type with fun. So my guess is what's gonna go on here is on move, we're going to be updating probably some variable that's going to deal with velocity or force up top here. And then every um, you know, 60 times a second, we'll be applying whatever that force is to our rigid body. 
as opposed to applying the force to our rigid body inside of on move, which maybe I like better, but let's see how they go about it. Functions as you continue your programming learning journey. Remember to add a set of curly braces beneath the function declaration. This is where you'll add your code. Excellent. In the next video, you'll add force to the player game object's rigid body. All right. So we're ready to apply force. Um, good stopping point. So remind me, we're going to be applying force next class. Do remind me at the beginning of next class, though, I do want to spend a few minutes um, going over the uh, exam. The exam will be during class time um, on uh, Friday. It'll be on uh, Blackboard. Uh, so, uh, um, so you won't meet in person in class, but I'll expect you to take the exam during class. A few of you have told me that you are uh, traveling or something like that. We'll make special arrangements, but take it during class if you, <laughs> if you can, so I don't have to do too many special things, but we'll make it work. All right. Um, so in any case, we'll talk about that at the beginning of class on Wednesday. Somebody remind me and I'll flip through the slides real quick and let you know kind of the things that I think are extra important versus the things that maybe aren't quite as important, but it'll only be Java stuff, nothing with Unity yet. Cool. Questions, comments, concerns, bribes. All right. I'll see everybody on Wednesday. Thank you.